Welcome to the podcast. My name is Sue Stockdale, Deputy Editor of Coaching Perspectives magazine. And today I'm speaking to Tiffany Gaskell from Performance Consultants International. So for the purposes of listeners of this podcast, Tiffany, that may not be familiar with what coaching is, how would you define what coaching is? I would define coaching as a relationship between coach and coachee that is, first of all, confidential, that enables the coachee to reach much higher levels of performance and also is a tailor-made leadership development for journey for that coachee. So Tiffany, how did you get into coaching? I got into coaching, I was actually working in a bank and I had been working there for five years. I absolutely loved it. We were a high performance team. We were really knocking the ball out of the park in terms of performance. What I found was that I didn't feel I was living my purpose. So I didn't feel that there was a reason beyond money for me being there. And one of those synchronistic things, two weeks before I left the bank, my friend called me and he said, have you heard about coaching? That was the first time I heard about it and it was in 1999. And it was an article where this lady had had a coach, she had a business, and when she started with the coach, she only had one shoe shop in New York. At the end of five years of coaching, she had 57 shoe shops, and I thought, wow, if coaching can do that for that lady, then what could it do for all the companies in the world? Wow, and that, that was the catalyst to get you to go move into coaching from working in the bank? That was... The thing that sparked my interest in coaching, I was off to do an MBA, I went to do my MBA, I was rather disappointed because there was nothing about people on this MBA, it was all about engineering models, but there was a conference that I went to and there was a lady there who was a coach and she did a sample coaching session and I saw coaching and I thought, wow, that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You literally see someone who comes in with so much baggage and they actually put it down off their shoulders before your very eyes. I mean, it's astounding. So no wonder it has such enormous impact on performance. Can you give me an example of what coaching looks like when it's been successful? An example that comes to mind is when I was coaching a director. He wanted to get onto the board of this company and in his mind there was one person who he had a relationship with that was going to block that happening. What he did was, or rather what we did in the coaching, was work on that so that he shifted in his own mind, and it's all about our internal world, in his own mind, his relationship with this person. The way that he actually um, outwardly changed his behaviour was that he, when he went into a room with this person, instead of sitting opposite the table, for example, he'd sit next to him. This completely changed the dynamic. And right there, as he changed that relationship, he got his position on the board. And, and I guess the, the thought that's uppermost in my mind as a coach is why do companies need a coaching culture these days? Mm. So from the company perspective, it's about performance improvement. So John Whitmore used to say that coaching is bigger than coaching and it is bigger than coaching because there's a triple bottom line effect of people, profit and planet. And that is where coaching is bigger than coaching. So from a people perspective, if you imagine you're working in an organization, if you can bring more of your potential to that, then your performance will improve. From a profit perspective, as performance improves, then there's an impact on profit. And then from a planet perspective, enlightened leaders make different choices for future generations. So if a company wants to embark on building a coaching culture, what are some of the key steps it needs to take? Mm. So there are three steps that I have top of mind. The first is that the leader walks the talk and he's fully bought into it. So that is the most important step, because if for a whole company to embark on this, it has to come from the top. The second is that the initiative underpins strategy. 
So we can't have it being something that's on the side of strategy or in a training department. It needs to be absolutely integrated and fundamental to strategy. And the last point is that as it goes along, that it's embedded in processes and systems, because otherwise the systems actually undermine the impact of the coaching culture. So that's a pretty huge undertaking for any company to think about embarking in all of these areas. How long is that going to take them? Mm. So the key thing is to bear in mind that change can start immediately and the journey can take as long as the organisation's needs in terms of how it's related to goals and how it's related to strategy. Uh, What needs to happen is that once it has been achieved that it is sustained and nourished because it's a bit like having a personal development journey. As you go through that journey, you have to regulate yourself to make sure that you don't fall back and fall into unseen traps. In terms of um, examples where we've done this, because I'm sure that's the next thing you're going to ask me. Yes. um, Then one that springs to mind is Linda, which is an industrial gas company and has 60,000 people globally. And with Linda, what we did was worked with them specifically on safety. So it was really about the application of coaching in the safety environment. We're able to show that by bringing in this coaching culture, there is a 74% improvement in safety performance. So that's, that's impressive, pretty impressive uh, information there, Tiffany. It seems to me that the measurement of this investment is probably going to be quite important for not only your firm, but also the company that's embarking on the coaching culture. How do they measure the results of their investment? Mm. Uh, This is one of my hobby horses. I am passionate about uh, measuring the return on investment because I know it's huge. Uh, We can show, so two things. First of all, in the um, book that coaching performance that came out last year we have put two ways of measuring the first one and we're sharing these with coaches as part of our remit to professionalize the coaching industry so we put two measures in there the first one is coaching for performance roi and this is a measurement to be used in one-to-one interventions so this can show you what impact you're having in that organization the second one is the performance curve this is something that we created in the last two years as a result of the safety work and it helps companies to think about where they are on the curve on the performance curve in relation to their culture so uh, and how that creates performance or not so those two tools are two tangible things and I would encourage people to buy the book to actually use those tools because we are sharing them openly with the industry That's a great way that coaches can use these useful tools as you describe them, Tiffany. You're making it all sound really easy. And and I'm imagining that companies may embark on this journey and then give up somewhere along the way. What are some of the challenges that you have seen or obstacles that companies face or that get in the way of them actually being successful in adopting a coaching culture? The things that get in the way of a company being successful are things like Um, people leaving and taking the passion for that with them. Now, this is why it has to be led from the top and not just from the CEO, but from the leadership team. We've got an example. We're working with a company in Romania at the moment and the MD has just left. Uh, The people in the organisation have been working with us over the last year and they're so passionate about it that when the new MD arrived, they the people said we want to continue with this work and we are continuing so that's an incredible way of of making sure that you know that agenda for having that coaching culture and bringing that in is held by the whole team and that's happening right now as we speak so important commitment from the top Mm. and when you've got that buy-in that the journey can continue on Mm. Sometimes like these days, you know, money gets tight in businesses, they have limited resources. I can imagine this type of thing is the first thing that gets cut. Yes. How do companies need to, what do they need to think about to sustain the change that they've begun? Well, you're absolutely right about it being the first thing that is cut, but it's because the benefits are not understood. 
by the organisations. And that's where we need to use measurements tools like the ones I was talking about to reflect what is happening inside the company. There's one company we were working with and we were able to show enormous impact. It was um, 1.2 million return per year for this program. Um, it was over, it was 800% again. And the company still cut the program. And it was because companies go into fear mode and they don't understand the value of human capital investment. So one of my missions, personal missions, is to help companies to understand that. Because as soon as you take people out of, um, well, as soon as they're in a difficult environment and there's fear all around and everything's being cut, then that's when performance absolutely dives. Does a coaching culture look different according to the geography that a company is located in? Mm. So we have an approach and philosophy which is global reach, local touch. Now, when we work with companies around the world, they're looking for one outcome, which is this coaching culture. So what we need to do is, as we go in locally, we need to meet people where they are, and that's one of the key tenets of coaching as well. So I really like that philosophy. Now, in terms of how that looks on the ground, in Korea, for example, people might have an aha moment around giving feedback because, and what I make up about that is the Koreans are very polite and so it's a new thing to give feedback. Whereas in Sweden, people might have an aha moment around dream goals and what I make up about that is that the Swedes are so practical. So you can see that um, different people um, chime with the, um, with coaching in different ways, but they're all on the same journey. So if I was a company that was impressed by what I was hearing and thinking about introducing a coaching culture, what would be the first thing that I, as a leader of a business, need to, to be doing to get started? Well, it really comes down to this, what's my strategic agenda? So I'm wanting to bring in a coaching culture for what? What's my vision in three years time? You know, where do I want the company to go? What do I want this journey to look like? It's making me think of John McFarlane's work at ANZ. And um, so John wrote the foreword to our book, Coaching for Performance. And in it, he really talks about um, what it is to create a meaningful journey for people. And this is... a. a at other times I've heard him say that um, it's easy to, well, once you've got the hard stuff in place, then this piece here, as in the people soft stuff, is the stuff that where magic happens. And that's how ANZ Bank went from um, being low on customer service to top of the charts. Tiffany, it seems like this coaching culture thing could be appealing to the millennial generation of leaders that are up and coming in organisations. What's your take on that? Mm. I believe that millennials will not put up with hierarchical structures. So not only are hierarchical structures not conducive to high performance, they are actually um, the things that repel millennials. So we have companies that we're working with who are consciously creating a coaching culture because they want to attract millennials and they want to put them in an environment where they thrive and they feel empowered and they have a meaningful role to play in the organisation. So it's a pretty savvy business decision for companies to embark on a coaching culture. Exactly. Finally, Tiffany, from our conversations today, it really seems that John Whitmore's legacy is woven through all the work that Performance Consultants does, has done in the past and is, is heading into the future. What would you say are the things that he's left as a legacy for Performance Consultants? He was such an inspiration to be around. I think that the thing that I um, remain astounded at with John is that he knew the role that coaching had to play back in coaching's infancy. So when he first wrote the book in the 90s, then he there were a handful of coaching organisations and now there's been an explosion of coaching around the world. So he knew the impact it could have. And what it's all been about is evolving human consciousness and people, planet and profit. So he was way ahead of his time. Thank you for your time, Tiffany. It's been fascinating to speak to you. Thank you very much for having me.